bring the meeting to order. Are there any changes or additions to the agenda as printed? Uh, we do have uh, an appointment for the Conservation Committee. Okay. What time, or was it any set, no set time? Uh, you know, I said that they Oh, could... you're talking about appointing a member. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yep. And anything else? I'd like to discuss uh, sprinkling upstairs here. Okay, sprinklers. Did you have a second item? No, that was it for me. Anyone else have anything? Okay. Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome Isa and Rebecca from the uh, university newspaper, the first meeting they're going to attend, of many, I assume. Or we'll see after the first one. Uh, and we're opening with a public hearing for the Vermont Community Development Grant Program. I'm going to turn the floor over to Barry. Are you? Okay. Uh, so we are a part of Jenna's Promise, which is a nonprofit helping people who are in recovery. Uh, we are looking to get a block grant for the old Pharaoh's uh, house uh, to pretty much rehabilitate it and make it a really nice coffee house and the second floor would be sort of living and that's why we're here. And so we're seeking final approval. And as a public hearing, it's open for any questions. That's the whole purpose of it. If anybody has the one. Probably add we were asking for five hundred thousand dollars from HUD. Uh, and you haven't asked for it yet. The application's due a week from tomorrow. There must be questions. <laughs> so can you, can you uh, elaborate a little bit more about what you hope to do with it? Yeah, so the um, Silver Living is going to be the second stage um, of recovery, essentially. So these are people who have to have a job. They have been sober for so many days and they're going to be paying rent. And the idea is kind of a symbiotic relationship with the coffee house itself, that they'll be able to work in the coffee shop to start to gain some skills. Um, it's going to be a pretty big thing, so we'll probably need more than once the sober living upstairs. We'll be bringing other people in from sober living who can, essentially we're training. We're trying to get them some skills, build their confidence up so that they can take the next step into the the world of, of, of not needing as much help, essentially, try to give them the confidence. And, and the restaurant piece is just your typical coffee shop. Got a menu laid out. Um, as you know, the coffee shop has been closed for quite some time, and the town really um, needs a coffee shop to kind of coalesce people as a central meeting place and to hang around, right? <laughs> And so do you have a model um, for this program or, uh, you know, are you inventing a new wheel or do you have a um, program that you're basing this on? We are inventing the wheel a little bit um, because there's not one in Vermont that's quite like this. Um, there's not one in New England that's quite like this, but we have seen some models out in Denver that work with the homeless in a very similar situation. They give them homes and they give them jobs and they train them up so that they can then go back out into the world and get an apartment. Um, so there have been some very successful models out there with different uh, risk groups, uh, but not specifically those in recovery. So this will be a little, a little different. How many, um, how, what, how many people are you going to house in the sober living? It's going to be, after the renovation, six bedrooms, and we're hoping to do about six to eight women. Okay. Yeah. Who's going to manage the coffee shop part? Who's going to be running that and overseeing? I mean, these women can't just do it on their own. Who's yeah. going to be doing that part of it? So Jenna and Petro LLC3 is going to be actually the owner of the building and of the coffee shop. And that is a low-profit business, essentially. So 
So that will still be within Don and Greg as an overall manager. Who takes care of the day to day? We're going to hire, 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 so it won't be sub. Won't be sublet. It will be run by. It Jennifer. will be within. It will be run it will by. Be, they'll be hired by Jennifer. Not. It won't be leased out to somebody. It's not going to be We're run by Jennifer. Be yeah. yeah. So Jennifer Promise is technically leasing it from Jenna Tatro LLC three. And Dennis Tatro LLC3 will be running the coffee shop. We will hire a general manager who has, um, we already have one in mind who has done many, many years in the coffee business and roasting and things like that, that we hope to kind of run the entire, entire business and keep an eye on everything and, and things like that. Yeah, um, unless you covered this already, uh, the timeline of physically what's going to happen in the building and where we'll be ready to go. So the application would go in uh, next Tuesday. It would probably be end of March, early of April, before they decided if they were okay with it, if, if they approved us. Once it's approved, it'd probably be two to three months to get contracts in place with all of our subcontractors and with the, the state and with HUD. Um, so we're looking about September, we'd be able to actually get into the building and start doing some renovations. And from there, we're looking at about an eight month turnaround. So uh, we're thinking spring of next year. And we already own the building, just, to, just so if that wasn't clear. Jenna Tatro LLC does own the building now. Dan? I'm just wondering who are your other partners in this? Do you have other partners? Uh, we are working with uh, the Recovery Center in Morrisville. They are going to help us with uh, the sober living on top. They are kind of helping guide us through the process and make sure that we have everything in line and they will be giving us some of the people who work in the coffee shop to start some of the people they think are are ready for that next step they'll be so they'll be helping quite a bit do they oversee the residents upstairs then too the idea is that the residents have gotten far enough along in their sobriety that they don't need a lot of overseeing that they've kind of taken that next step of they might still need the community of fellow People in recovery to help them stay strong, but they're working, they're on their own, they're starting to take those steps. Um, so there'll be meetings regularly that they'll be going to, they'll be um, still have to follow random drug testing um, to make sure because if they do come back positive, they will have to leave and they will have to pay rent. And if they don't pay their rent, they will also have to leave. So well, these are folks that are then sober for quite some time, mm -hmm. they're just ready to make. The leap away from a really structured sober living house where there's a manager and curfews, a lot of structure, to something a little bit more normal like. Right? And they're right. All right. <coughs> That's just a necessary step in the recovery. Right. You have some questions, Brian? Yeah, I, I received a handful of questions uh, by email. Um, so first, uh, is there data to support uh, that Johnson is the best, most effective place for this? So if you look at some of the data that came out of the report um, last year, you see that there is, uh, I think, 16 facilities in all of Vermont that can handle drug addiction specifically. Uh, there's very few sober housing, and there's even less for females. There is only one two i think or one for mothers and then only a small handful for females from there so there's not enough beds in this this state at all um so eight is probably not quite enough but it's a start and uh essentially johnson's kind of central in lamoille so we have a lot of lamoille itself has a lot of drug addiction here and they Johnson will be a good central point for getting to Burlington, getting to other places, but also being able to help the surrounding communities by not being too far one way or the other. Okay. Um, will the property remain on the tax roll? Because it is going to be owned by the LLC3, it is still privately owned, not by the nonprofit. So yes, and because we're doing renovations, it will actually make the building worth more, so it should increase property taxes for the building. Good. So how will this help to attract families and businesses to the area? Um, well, certainly having a 
coffee shop in town will um, attract tourists that are coming through anyways and probably make them finally stop to have uh, a place to go. And, and we hope it's an upscale coffee shop uh, where people will come and they'll go, this is the best coffee place I've ever been to in my life and they'll want to come back, all right? And plus they're going to love the coffee. So um, as far as a coffee shop goes, does that attract people to come to Johnson? Well, probably not, but at least they'll have a good experience while they're traveling through Johnson, or the residents of Johnson will, will enjoy it quite a bit. Um, if the question is directed more about um, sober living upstairs, um, then I would say, what was the question again? Is, uh, how will this help to attract exactly. families and businesses? That's a tough question. Does sober living attract anybody? You know, probably by its nature, no. But here's something to think about. If they're not in sober living, where are they? Okay, they're out in the community and they're using it. Uh, how do you tell you? If they're using that's not a good thing. All right? And maybe some of you have friends and neighbors that, that know what that's like. Um, so our, if we can get them off of the streets and stop them from using, let me tell you, that's a good thing. All right, so yeah, that will pass on everybody, including Johnson. Are they Vermont residents? Are they just Vermont? That's our goal, okay? Um, we want to stick to that goal. I mean, what, can there be an exception? You know, their parents live here, but they don't. I don't know. We'll cross that bridge. But that's definitely our goal is to stick with Vermonters. Yeah. I mean, ideally, based on what you're describing, people will not even notice. I mean, it should be yeah. it should be a prosperous, beautiful <coughs> building running a business. You know, people working in it. People will not notice. No. And hopefully, we'll create a community that finds strength in each other, and then stay within the community and continue to give back because. Johnson gave them something, and now they want to give Johnson something. And hopefully, it will help to create a stronger community. And I just want to point out, Amy, the study you mentioned earlier. Uh, there's a real shortage of beds uh, around Vermont and Lamoille County and every place else. It, we would we would have a terrific problem if we didn't have enough Vermonters to fill the beds. Um, so, uh, moving on, uh, the next question, uh, how much time has or will our town administration be spending on this uh, private or nonprofit venture? So that's kind of more a question for myself. Um, I have spent so far uh, less than 10 hours uh, working on this project. I've got a meeting coming up later this week uh, that'll be kind of a lengthy meeting. Uh, it'll probably be the longest one stretch that I've spent on this, but um, yeah, I I'm thinking total project start to finish uh, for the grant application uh, will probably be about 30 hours or so. Uh, because we took it on. Uh, this we could ha have referred this to the village, but we were willing, so we we're taking it on. Um, so about thirty hours of my time for the application. Uh, the money I'll be doing, uh, I'll be the town will will be kind of the financial agent, so that will involve a little bit more of Rosemary's time. Once we actually receive the money and start dispersing it out, we'll be doing invoices and checks to make sure that they follow their plan and uh, all proper procurement procedures for uh, how to spend the money that, you know, that especially for construction, I don't think there's going to be anything that really involves Greg's equipment that he already owns. It'll probably be bringing in a lot of contractors. So we'll have to make sure that all of those are, are produced properly. Um, so that'll be a little bit more of our time during that administration period, but um, maybe another 45 hours between the two of us. And that's, I'd say, a pretty generous estimate. It's very likely to be less. 
Um, and, and I would just add that these type of grants require a municipality, a municipality to be the sponsor and, and, and to put in the application, as well as uh, Brian's job description is town administrator and the economic development coordinator. So that's part of his job is to do stuff like this. And one way to look at it is we're taking what's currently an abandoned building, a vacant building, and uh, it's been in disrepair for a number of years, and they're gonna really fix it up and bring it back to life. It'll be a uh, refurbished building, it'll be back on the tax rolls at a more competitive uh, tax rate than what it currently is. So it's really good, a win-win. Uh, and the last question was, uh, will this impact future opportunities for securing HUD grants? So in the short term, yes. Um, usually HUD grants, or particularly the block grants, don't want to give money. They do uh, applications every three months. They don't want to give money, and then three months later give money back to the same place. They want to spread it out all across Vermont. So that would, in the short term, if we had another project in the next few months, it might, yeah, we kind of give you guys money, so we're going to wait until the next time around. You can keep applying for it until you say you don't want to, or until you get the money, so that's the nice thing. Um, but it would only be maybe a year before you could make the argument that it was worth coming back here, because they haven't given money to Lamoille in a very long time, and they desperately want to get money into Lamoille. So a year from now, if there was another really good project, I'm sure they would be willing to. And, and I, that I would just add that Johnson benefited from this funding several years ago when we were working on um, establishing a market after uh, Grand Union closed. And I would say um, not only was required for the municipality to be involved, but it was really great because I mean, we've achieved something good and this could be another example. And if they don't ask for it, you know, we don't ask for it, another town will. I know that Morristown is applying for an affordable housing project. Maybe it's a slightly different part of money, but you just need to be out there and asking because if not, others will. Uh, uh, hours, are you going to at least cut a coffee shop where you say lunch, breakfast, lunch, 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 four, four, two, three? The reason I ask is, <laughs> Between the people coming off the rail trail, coming into town looking for lunch, and we have an Airbnb, and oh my god, I'm so tired of telling people there's no place to have lunch. Oh, it's like they really want breakfast, and they really, they really want breakfast, but they also really want lunch, and they're all happy to walk into town and walk all around what are your hours so we're looking at starting at 5 30 um, because we really want to get the commuters going uh back and forth as well so in burlington are going into morrisville so we're trying to get those guys and we'll be closing around 7 30 maybe 8 and there's talks that we're going to maybe extend the hours a bit more in the summer because we want to have smoothies we want to sell smoothies as well as um, breakfast sandwiches and some eggs and things like that. So that might take a frozen yogurt machine. So then we'd be selling frozen yogurt as well during the summer. Did you say from 5.30 in the morning to 8.00 in the morning? Oh, 5.30 to 7.30 at night. Oh, yeah. oh wow. <laughs> that makes me feel That helped. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it'll be, it'll be two That should help you. Yeah. That will help me tremendous. And there will be some sandwiches and, and things like that and baked goods and and another quick question now. Um, so these women that work there, are they going to make enough money to be able to pay their rent? Or will they be working part-time there and somewhere else as well? You don't know. They should they should make enough, easily make enough money to pay, to so pay their rent. Room, and and more basically they should be totally self-sufficient, right? Between the rent and your other expenses. What they make from the restaurant should cover that. We also have a partnership with Smugs where they are willing to bring a van, pick up people there, and bring them to Smugs so that they can work. So if they don't want to work in the coffee shop for whatever reason, maybe that's not their cup of tea. Okay. <laughs> 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 I didn't actually mean that. Um, <laughs> you should 
should also know that you know people with substance use disorder, their managers and accountants and lawyers and regular people, folks just like all of us. And you know, we're looking for managers, obviously, to run the run, run, but wouldn't it be fantastic if we could also find one that could live upstairs and become the manager of the place? I lied, I'm not going to be quiet. <laughs> um, so upstairs, you can sleep six or eight. Mm -hmm. Does that mean six or eight bedrooms? And do they have a community living room and a community kitchen? A community living room, a community kitchen, two, bath two full bathrooms. It's six bedrooms with two bedrooms would have two beds. Um, if we did find that that was a little too many people, we would probably reduce down to six. There won't be any less than six. Um, but we I would stay talking about that situation. We'll right. that later. I, I live that situation. Oh, okay. Yeah. Welcome. Welcome. Yeah. The rent Shane also won't be too high. Shane's been trying to. <laughs> oh, I, I don't have a question. I just want to speak up and support. Um, and in full disclosure, I've been working with them on the Polar Splash event, so I, I'm, I have a bias. Uh, but another reason I have a bias is that I have dealt with this issue. I am someone who's in recovery. I have spoken to a lot of friends and, and peers who are in recovery. And I know that the two biggest hurdles in front of people in recovery are housing and employment. And they are working on hitting both of those hurdles, knocking them out of the way for a group of people that are very vulnerable and need all the help that they can get. And I think that that's something that we absolutely should be in, in support of. If there are other organizations who want to do similar work, we should support them too. You know. Um, these are the what you said and what you guys said uh, uh, is that. Because we're going to embark in the spring, uh, a group of us are going to work in a working communities plan, at least a planning grant session, um, at which Johnson's, or rather this county's proposal is to support workforce transitions for three groups. One of those groups is anybody in recovery transitioning to jobs or trying to hold on to their job or whatever. So, uh, you know, that planning work is going to give us a lot more information and contacts and whatever about what goes on in the world or elsewhere or here, even here in Vermont. Um, so it puts us all in a better position here to know about that world. But also back to the question of what can this enterprise do for the town or what will it give the town? Uh, I think it's going to give the town a way to say, here's maybe, you know, we didn't follow, we invented our own model, basically, incorporating different best practices, but come learn. Uh, I think we're going to have something to, that people are going to want to know about. Thank you, right? That's the hope. I got just one comment or a question, maybe uh, maybe a coffee shop. But am I correct in understanding coffee is already on its way? <laughs> yes. So uh, currently at IGWK Draw, there is a box of green beans ready to be roasted. So we are in the process of deciding which bean we actually want to start with, whether that's Brazilian beans or Costa Rican beans. Or we've got to figure that out. So we do have a few that we'll test out, do a small sample roasting, and. Hopefully we'll, in a very short amount of time, know what coffee we're going to be brewing and hopefully have a really, really amazing cup of coffee that you guys all really want. <laughs> it's your own, it's our own coffee. It'll have the Tennis Promise logo on it. And we're planning to distribute this coffee, not just in Johnson, Vermont, but mm -hmm. all over the world. Uh, kind of the Paul Newman model, mm -hmm. where certain proceeds go back to Tennis Promise. Um, but we need a way to sustain ourselves in the long term. And the grant money is nice, and donations have been fantastic. Thank you, everybody. But we know we can't depend on that source of income forever. We have to make our own way. We have to run this like a business for long-term success, not just for, well, we don't have any grant money, therefore we're going to have to cut back. Um, 
the grant money is great and the donations are great. Please don't stop because you think you're making a lot of money out of this. But um, that's the, the general idea behind the coffee roasting part of the business. And you can come and see the roasting happen right at the coffee shop. It's going to be roasting right there on Main Street. Yes, yep. So where the bar will be, right behind it will be the actual roaster, and you should be able to see the whole thing start from it being made to it going in your cup. And if you live close enough, maybe you can smell the morning coffee. <laughs> Okay, we're coming up on the end of the half hour. Is there any other questions? Uh, two. She was first. Uh, so I, this is something that college students talk about all the time, is that we don't get down into Johnson during the winter because it's just too cold. Um, and I, I don't know if this is um, something that's actually true or if this is just a college student observation. We tend to stay up on the hill and not think about anything else. Um, but some people pointed out that there's far less traffic to businesses and, and stuff from the students, which is a huge population than Johnson. It is. Um, how do you guys plan to pull in students and student traffic? And potentially, how can Mason Medicine help you? Maybe so, climate change will take care of them. <laughs> <laughs> so right now, the nonprofit is working with the college itself to try to make, uh, create some kind of agreement Really, in any way, they're pretty open, whether that's figuring out transportation or bringing things up to the college itself, whatever it is, we're looking to really make a connection and, and work together. And I mean, we really hope that we make something so good and an environment that you guys like so much that you want to come off the hill and miss the new hangout. You have to walk back. This is the worst price But you'll have coffee. Both of them. You'll be warm. You'll be warm. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, there was one more question. Um, yeah, I just wanted to um, also agree that this is certainly something that we all should support here at Johnson. Um, I came to Johnson when uh, just a couple years ago, and so we still had the coffee shop. And I miss the coffee shop, although I don't miss the bath. The plans are actually up there if anybody wants to take a camera up now. We can probably leave them with you too if you want to put them out somewhere where they can see them for a few days. Sure. Uh, yeah, we can find room for them downstairs. All right. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The, we have to adopt the resolution. It's in your packet. Oh, okay. So I guess I would entertain a motion from the board on adopting the resolution for the grant application. So, yes. oh, Mr. Chairman. Do we have a second? Second. Do you have any discussion? I wonder for the minutes, um, do you have something more precise than. We can give you a copy of this. Too. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, we do need. It might be best if we read it because. Okay. Uh, the. What part the, we read? The, the legal requirement includes the minutes, so. Uh, I've got one that's filled out. If you want to. I think it's kind of the, the safest option given so the requirement. So we need to read this whole thing? Okay. Okay, uh, resolution for VCDP grant application authority, single applicant, whereas the town of Johnson here and after applicant is applying for a grant under the Vermont Community Development Program, and whereas it is necessary that an applicant be made and agreements be entered into the state of Vermont now, therefore, be it resolved as follows. One, that applicant possesses the legal authority as defined in State Act 10 BSA 683, subsection 8, to apply for the grant and to administer the program. And number two, that applicant apply for a grant under the terms and conditions of said program and agree hereby to enter into certifications and assurances thereof. And Three, the applicant has a duly adopted and current municipal plan, 815-16, that was adopted and that the project is consistent with said plan. And 
Four, the applicant has received documentation from the Regional Planning Commission that the project is consistent with the regional plan. And number five, that Brian Story is hereby authorized to be contact person and as such to provide on behalf of the applicant all documents and information necessary for the completion of said application and to provide such coordination as may be necessary for said application. And number six, that Brian Story, town administrator, who is either the chief executive officer, CEO, as defined by 10 BSA 683 subsection 8, or is the town manager, the city manager, or the town administrator, in this case is town administrator, is hereby designated to serve as the authorizing official for the grants management online system from Telegram. And number seven, it is understood that if the application is funded, the receipt of VCDP grant funds as federal funds pass through the state of Vermont may require that an audit of the applicant be conducted under the provisions of the Single Audit Act as amended and that VCDP funds may be used to fund only limited portions of the audit cost. If we so elect, it'll be passed today and signed by the legislative body and so attested by the clerk. Is that good enough for a motion? Yeah, hopefully someone can send me an electronic copy. Okay, is that what your motion was for? Yes, it was, Mr. Chairman. I thought that's what it was. And the second? Yeah, that was pretty close. Yep, pretty close. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? Congratulations, Jenna. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you guys for coming in. I would just add um, yeah, 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 yeah. that there will be an opportunity for Janice Promise to talk, speak to the town meeting uh, about the project and how the impact will be in the town. Okay, moving on. Is the board prepared to approve the meeting minutes of January 20th and 27th? So moved, Mr. Chairman. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. The motion is second. Is there any discussion? Okay. So, Donna, please note that Nat has uh, abstained from the 27th because he was not here for that. We'll take one vote, but only count his for the 20th. Any more discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? I just have it. Rosemary, you got any report? Um, just a set of warrants and the town report went to the printer today. Who oh, did? Yeah. Good. Do you want this or this to Brian? Anybody got any questions for Rosemary? Do you need to sign this? Uh, yes, she needs to attest. attest. Okay. Anybody else got anything for Rosemary? If not, you know, we're still a little early for Leah, I think. But you want to just wait 10 minutes in case anybody else comes? You're on the docket for 745. So you have a couple of items go over quickly? Uh, I think um, we can do the appointment for the Conservation uh, Commission. Okay. Uh, yes? Um, so, uh, Lois, uh, and the Conservation Commission have forwarded Carrie, um, sorry, Carrie Watson. Watson. Carrie Watson. Uh, Carrie Watson's name as, as a suggested member for the Conservation Commission to fill a vacancy. Okay. Thank you, Carrie. Welcome. You want to add any words or you don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody got any questions for Kerry, or are we prepared to approve? Or would somebody nominate? Uh, I would nominate her. Second. 
We have a nomination and a second. Any other nominations? Here we go. All those in favor, say five is saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? Congratulations. You got anything else real quick? Uh, I think if you'll permit me to skip to item two, uh, the modifications to the capital, the capital budget and plan. Um, you've got page five from the capital plan in front of you. Uh, again, it's a pretty lengthy document. I only printed the page five because it's the only one that we have changes on. Um, so in the past, uh, we've shared a, uh, a tractor with, um, we shared a tractor with the village, uh, and it's been kind of become clear that our needs and the village's needs aren't aligning very well. They want a smaller tractor. We'd like a larger one, um, and it's come to the point where we're not going to be able to share the equipment anymore. So. Uh, we, we need to purchase one. Um, we discussed this a little bit in the past. Uh, I've got a little bit more detail, so we're amending uh, that it'll be a 75 horsepower plus uh, tractor equipped with a class two hitch and a mowing deck um, for any replacements. We're going to purchase the first one used and that's going to inform uh, whether we buy it used again in the future, what kind of lifespan we expect out of it. Uh, but we're planning right now for at least 10 years out of the uh, piece that we'll buy. Okay. Uh, at a cost kitted out with the mower and ev everything else that it needs uh, to be less than $100,000. Okay. This is primarily for roadside mowing and Rail trail mowing? Primarily for roadside mowing and uh, field maintenance and mowing. Uh, we also can use a, a couple pieces of road equipment for, uh, that will help us with uh, gravel road maintenance, uh, kind of in between regrading the whole thing. And uh, we can run uh, a disker, uh, which if you think of the, the older farm implements for making the grooves. It's a very similar thing that, that they're kind of angled. So it helps reclaim uh, material from the shoulder and bring it back towards the center of the road uh, so that we hopefully don't have to add as much material if we can occasionally use something like this to take it from the shoulder and bring it back towards the center. We have equipment to do that right now that we're using on the other tractor, but the other tractor is really underpowered for this. Uh, so we'll get a lot more use out of something that's a little bit larger and has a more powerful engine. Uh, the other piece of equipment that we want to use for this that we have right now is a uh, uh, something like a roller. So that'll be just compaction on, on that. that w right now we're kind of using uh, well, with, with the tractor, we'd be able to have more, you know, a dedicated piece that we can drag behind that should provide better compaction than us just driving on it a bit. With that disc, does that help us with the stormwater runoff issue that we have? It is a improved, it is an approved uh, tool for managing uh, the roadsides at runoff and sediment. Okay. Uh, and we were, the state gave us money to purchase that equipment for that purpose uh, as part of a grant program that was made available through the MRGP. Uh, the MRGP, that's the Municipal Road General Permit. And this allows us to bring our roads narrower too, doesn't it? It because we've just been moving them out. It will help stop that spread. Uh, it would maybe a little bit optimistic to say it'll help us bring ones uh, bring anything in narrower than it is right now. Um, 
but it will have a big impact on the tendency for roads over time to widen. So what are you looking for us tonight is to adopt the- I Adopt the language as, as printed. As printed. Um, so we'd be adopting the whole plan with these suggested changes. Right. Where exactly are the changes in here from what it used to be? Or what are the changes? I apologize, this is the wrong page. This is the following. This is the page after the changes. Um, <laughs> yeah, so this is what I get for printing one page out of the whole document. Should we go Try back to, to save it? money? Yeah, I, I think save we should go back to it so that okay. I've got the. So we probably won't adopt this now. Yeah, I, I've got a pretty good handle on what it is, but I couldn't tell you word for word what the changes okay. are. Uh, I added one paragraph that describes the tractor. Um, yeah, the key characteristics I, I described, well, but. Uh, I thought I was blind because I can't find the tractor. <laughs> Okay. The thought it. was good, though. I tried to say it again. <laughs> Two pieces of paper. So we'll bring it up. You've now explained it. You, we'll bring it up uh, next meeting. Yeah, sure. With the real paper. Okay. With that good piece of news, Leah, I think they can. Well, thank you for inviting me to speak on this subject. Um, for those of you who do not know, my name is Leah Hanson. I'm the audio boss. I'm the And I'm here today on behalf of the Royal County Planning Commission. Um, I'm also a Johnson resident, so if the question is asked, uh, my personal perspective might interject, but I'll try to separate the two. Uh, and I'm going to potentially be focusing on something that I have been involved with with the Oral County Planning Commission for the past six months. Um, we have a grant um, that's about a year long that we received from the USDA Rural Development to provide broadband planning assistance to the Royal County Townships that are interested. Um, and through that, we have been able to work with some towns in Memorial, like Johnson, have already had dedicated broadband committees. Um, so wherever we could, we connected with the committees and asked what they need for assistance and tried to deliver based on our abilities and just to match their interests. We have also started uh, some very active citizen groups with some, in, in some other towns that previously did not have them. So really a lot of our work has been on community organizing and uh, finding those key champions within communities that can then come to the select boards and present, ideally along with us. Um, and I know that you guys have a broadband committee that has been looking into this alongside with us, if not ahead of us. Um, and um, I, I felt that it would be good to complement what the committee has been doing with the knowledge that we gained um, because certainly a lot of what we have been doing has been focusing on educating ourselves on what's out there. There is a lot happening right now in the, uh, on the broadband front. And most of it is happening in the communities that have these active citizen groups that are very driven to accomplish results. Um, I would say somewhat unfortunate, unfortunate this is how we end up, the municipalities ended up dealing with this very complex issue. It's because we recognize that having high speed internet is very important, but we do not have adequate legislation on federal level and resources on a state level to basically have this delivered to us like electricity was some many years ago. So the communities that are taking charge are the ones that have success. Um, we've, over the, these past six months, we've organized uh, some meetings with providers that were telling us you know, what it is that they do. Some communities specifically ask us to bring particular providers to them, to speak with them. So, for instance, Walcott requested to 
get you know on the journey by talking to consolidated communications. So we've had that meeting. Um, we got received we got a request from another provider, Mansfield Community Fiber, to connect them with Waterville and Belvedere. So we did that and we had a meeting. We had some regional meetings with state personnel. We have been looking into legislation, funding sources, and essentially, um, based on what I know right now, I, I, I see two fundamental paths forward for communities that are interested. Um, and that is that you, pers you pursue these improvements um, in broadband access and speed as an individual municipality or you join with others um, and, and, and do it together. Um, there's also a third alternative that is a do-nothing alternative. Um, and because I, I will mention this right now because I don't have a better spot in my presentation, although a question might arise that no, we are in this very unique spot right now where um, electric distribution utilities are looking into potential, you know, what their role would be in providing broadband. And we've met with uh, Ramon Richie Co-op last week, and that allowed me to even a little better appreciate where they are with, with these explorations. And I would say that right now, relying on the co-op to become a broadband service provider uh, is somewhat along the line of doing nothing um, because it's a tremendous, uh, it's a tremendous undertaking. They are getting oriented, looking for what their role could be, uh, but right now that role is not the lead entity that is, you know, that is willing to take on being a broadband provider. More likely, it's a role of a partnership with some other entity. In, by way of you know building infrastructure together that could serve both the co-op as well as as well as the broadband utility. Um, I'll give you a few examples of these um, pursue of broadband as an individual municipality. It has been done successfully. Uh, one town is Tatsbury. Um, this is a town where a committee of two gentlemen worked over several years to get two broadband grants to town that allowed them to build about 13 miles of fiber optic infrastructure. Uh, the town provided some contribution to that effort. Um, the infrastructure right now is town owned um, and is leased to a provider called Kingdom Fiber that provides service. Um, in the near future, it's possible that that town-owned infrastructure will be folded into a new municipality that is in formation right now in the Northeast Kingdom. It's uh, it's um, and the north. It's I think it's Northeast Kingdom Community Communication Union District. So we've seen some success. Crossbury is, is one of one of the municipalities that, that has done this. Not. Okay. Not too far from us, uh, to the west, down the Fletcher, um, is pursuing this as an individual town, and they are creating a public partner, private partnership with Mansfield Community Fiber to design, build, and operate the fiber optic infrastructure. The town, actually, this meeting is having a vote, uh, is my understanding. Uh, to acquire a municipal bond to build this infrastructure. So, if that happens and the town will, uh, I believe, will negotiate with this with community fiber. The third example is a little farther away, but Consolidated Communications has had some success in New Hampshire with uh, partnering with municipalities. I'd say their flagship town is Chesterfield, New Hampshire, about the same size as Johnson where, again, through a public-private partnership, um, the town now has infrastructure built out. Fiber optic, it's, it's a, it's a state-of-the-art, what oftentimes folks turn to when they build. Um, I have a note there that town took a municipal bond of 1.8 million to help consolidate it to, to this build-out. Consolidated contributed substantial amount of money too, but it was not a 
the, the type of initiative where I'm trying to provide and say, I will do it all. Okay, so I think it's possible to do something as a sole municipality, but it almost always involves a partnership between a public entity and a private entity. And I feel that's a path that, that it's worth considering for Johnson and, um, you know, negotiating thing with somebody is not a bad thing, and if it doesn't work, then you turn on to the next option. So, you know, something to consider. I, I would not, I would not give up on it. Is it is a possibility? Okay. The, the other option, uh, which which is which has to do with a collection of municipalities getting together, formally called as Communication Union District. Is has been enabled by legislation um, last year, but has been in existence um, to maybe in a slightly different form for quite a few years. Communication Union District is imagine our oil solid waste district. It's a, it's a type of entity where municipalities delegate a member uh, to this new municipality, and the new municipality is charged with this task of building broadband infrastructure. Uh, again, this end up, ends up inevitably being a public partner, private partnership of some sort because quickly, I mean, we know this that you know folks uh, who nominate volunteers to deal with this complex issue, it, it can become very overwhelming. So benefiting for some, some some professional advice is is uh, is really useful. What happens in the end is that the that that the infrastructure that gets built is owned by this municipality, but it's designed and it's operated and maintained, and the service is provided by an internet service provider. Okay. Um, I I. I I, I should say that uh, both for a municipality as well as for this collection of municipalities, there is a financing mechanism that can insulate a municipality completely from taxpayer liability. So that's that's really important. Um, these entities uh, can get uh, can obtain resources in the form of revenue bonds. That uh, it's also complicated to get to that point for this entity. But uh, it's not allowed that taxpayers or, or this infrastructure can, can have an assessment fee that would be additional additional fee for ratepayers to, to build for this service. So I think that's that's something that's been really important and has been driving a lot of municipalities uh, to consider this communication union district as a possibility and the map that we have here. Um, I was just this recently from the state of Vermont. It's a, it's a map that shows where there are communication union districts either in place or in planning or under a study. This one, um, this red one here, it's the one that is uh, a whole large success that everybody's looking uh, up to. It's EC Fiber. I think they have 24 towns and um, they they connected. They've been at for several years. They've connected several thousand customers to their network um, by now. Okay. Um, next step. We have some workshops lined up. One here in Johnson is going to be on February twenty seventh, where we are going to be discussing these options in a little bit more detail. Um, I think it would behoove the communities that we work with, including Johnson, to pick a path and, and start digging into it. I, I think that um, it's not inconceivable that uh, several paths can be, uh, can be pursued concurrently. Um, and that there is also a possibility, we at the Old Welfare Planning Commission, we are interested for Communities, and I think you've already voted a support for this, is to apply for a, for a grant from the state that would allow us to look into the feasibility and a business plan of building this broadband infrastructure in the, in the town of Johnson and, and other towns that are interested.
So I was hoping that this would be a really upbeat, uh, but I don't know if my tone is like really honest. <laughs> Uh, and it's, it's um, you know, maybe technically not very um, interesting subject, but I, I do feel that there is a lot happening right now. You have folks who are interested in working on this. It's not time to stop. Uh, it really is something it needs to keep happening. Um, and we are here as a resource um, to, to, you know, to push this forward. Um, Questions? Yes. Yeah. So if Comcast and Consolidated are aren't they the two primary white um in that providers in Johnson would they be the ones that you would tend to go to to work with in, initially or not necessarily? It's a, I, I think that's a very valid approach. Uh, that's why some of our communities, they were not even willing to start exploring these other paths. Um, uh, they, they, they started with consolidated. They had them, you know, they invited them for a meeting, to a meeting, consolidated came, and the meeting had a certain feel to it, a certain finding to it, and it just gave the community a grounded, um, well, you know, to be determined. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't have consolidated, so I don't know. To be determined. Um, yeah, uh, Shane? Somebody calls the question. <laughs> I think Shane had a question. Uh, yes, I was, I was wondering, say we do go that kind of route where we're working with a uh, already established company um, to build out coverage or, or improve coverage or how would we then, I guess, you know, in some of these cases, it would be more easier than others to make sure that it is owned by the ratepayers um, and not by, you know, not have that infrastructure owned by Consolidated. Um, and I think if we're putting town resources or, or, you know, county resources into it, then having it owned by the ratepayers is the ideal way to go. Um, so I'm just wondering what your, research in other towns has shown about that. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, ideally, it would be really cool if providers extended on their own and municipalities would not have to get into this business. Um, but yes, a small municipality is getting involved and there are some public resources on the line that there is reasonable to establish what this public partnership should look like. And I don't have all the answers for that right now, but that's why, you know, if you get a provider in the room, uh, that's when you ask the questions. And, and there are different models out there in terms of who owns the infrastructure, long-term, short-term. You know, town gets a bond, there can be an agreement with the provider that the provider pays bonds payment to the town. I mean, there are just, I know that this can work, but the details, and I haven't been a part of the negotiations, um, so the details of it are, are to be worked out. Uh, but, but, you know, you won't find out unless, um, unless uh, you get to talk to folks. And I, I would say some folks are willing to talk and some will not talk to you, and that will also inform your efforts. A couple yeah. questions. Um, in Fletcher in particular, but also Chesterfield, New Hampshire, other towns who have taken out bonds. It's the expectation there that the bonds are repaid through ratepayers or through taxes? The taxes are not involved. So it's paid? It's paid by the, and, and that's where you get to the details of the mechanisms. In New Hampshire, it's a little bit different because they have a new legislation, but it's a little bit different that allows to do an assessment to, to create an assessment fee on the newly built infrastructure. So I believe in Chesterfield what they're doing is they are, in addition, those who subscribe to the new service utilizing the fiber optic infrastructure, in addition to their fee for service, they pay a $10 fee attached to the bond, a $10 assessment fee a month. Uh, that is going to last over the duration of the bond, uh, let's say if it's 20 years, 
it's anticipated that it's going to be decreasing, so 10 or less as they go forward. Yeah. But in, in, in Vermont, that, that wouldn't work because the assessment fee is not a part of how this gets repaid. Yeah. It gets repaid, so Vermont has to find different ways. But it's not, uh, it's not allowed that the tax resources would be, would be available for this. So, um, in the town of Fletcher, right, because they seem close by and it seems like they have an interesting model, um, how long do they expect it will take from town meeting day if the bond gets approved to building out the infrastructure to all the way to repaying the bond? So, my understanding is that what's happening in Fletcher is that Mansfield Community Fiber has already started fiber build out. And the way the public part private partnership looks like there, and that's the model that they have been proposing to some other communities that I have been a part of, is that they are building a portion of the infrastructure from their own pocket. Okay, they get loans, they have their own business um, resources, and so they build to a certain point, but they cannot build the whole town. So that's where the town of Fletcher proposed, or they got into the discussions, for these back roads where Mansfield community is not reaching, uh, that's what the municipal bond would be for. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, so the the portion that Mansfield is building from their own resources, that's already on the ground. Uh, and I believe I I, I I think if they secure the resources, I, I don't know exactly, but it would not be a very long time turnaround. Okay. To get to building the infrastructure. Yes. Otherwise Mansfield would come back. Uh, if, if the town was not pursuing the municipal bond option, they would come back and build out the rest, but it would be at a later date. And they've been upfront with that strategy. Their strategy is to build along main routes and then, you know, to a substantial big enough territory to capture customer base and then come back mm -hmm. and build out to the last mile in case a community does not want to wait, like Fletcher, they are considering this municipal bond option. You mentioned a few minutes ago that uh, the ratepayers were going to pay the bill, but you have a, a slide here on Crassberry that they uh, received three hundred thousand dollars to build thirteen miles of fiber optic, but the town contributed twenty five thousand dollars. So then it says this town owned infrastructure is leased to Kingdom Fiber. Mm -hmm. So is King Kingdom Fiber paid the town back that 25,000 that the town put up for that? that I don't know uh, about the 25,000. Uh, I, 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 I don't know. But the Kingdom Fiber is making payments to town. I don't know how much, you know, and what, what the exact business deal with that is. Um, okay. Uh, I just wanted a clarification because you said the ratepayers uh, were, were paying it, uh, but this gives you the impression that the town paid twenty five thousand. Uh, uh, they may this. have, you know, because Crassbury is unique because they got these grants, and I imagine that these grants require a certain match, and that's what the town paid for. Um, that's how it got initially established, um, but you know what happened later on. Um, I don't know in detail. You know, we need, we need to talk to those folks. Okay. Um, the NEKCUD is is open to accepting new member territories, towns. Yes, we have. So we we've been collaborating with the Northeast Kingdom Initiative because that's where our funding comes comes through that collaboration. Mm -hmm. And along that process, they've asked us: Are there any towns that are adjacent to the Northeast Kingdom? that would be considering, uh, could be interested in being a part of our effort. And I said, well, there is one that I clearly heard from, but some others might be interested. So you may have seen a pre-feasibility study 
with some towns being mentioned or contemplating as part of that conglomerate um, communication union district. Uh, we continuously keep asking, you know, the general thought is that they would be interested. At this point, what would need to happen is uh, we'll know after town meeting how many of those North Eastern towns are joining a, a district. Uh, any other towns that would want to join would need to apply and, you know, be either accepted or, or, or not accepted. Um, but yes, they, they are open to it. Is the plan to be congruous? Do the towns have to be touching each other in a block, or can we be an island down? I, I asked uh, about that. Uh, it would be better if they were contiguous, but yeah. if there is there is a possibility of non-contiguous district, and you know some other other towns from Memorial might be interested in that option. I, I would say that the biggest. The biggest advantage of those districts is combining human resource. Yeah. I mean, it's an extremely complex matter. Yeah. Um, you know, folks can burn out unless they are really driven and pursuing, and unless it is a, you know, a very easy scenario for a provider to strike a deal with the community. Mm -hmm. Johnson is, 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 you know, tough because a lot of Johnson is already served by what's currently consider high speed internet 25 over 3 that's comcast okay so um it's it's difficult but um that's the advantage of the district is that you have a scale certain scale which can attract providers um and um, it probably will the downside is that it probably would take longer um, that's why I'm saying it's also possible for a town to join a district and leave a district. And I would not say it's inconceivable to be pursuing or looking at other options for the benefit of the town while something else is in the works. That's why I'm saying I feel like it's possible to, uh, to be contemplating several scenarios here. Uh. Um, we do have a broadband committee. Um, I, I don't think it's unfair to characterize it as sort of floundering. They, they, they're having troubles on how to go forward. This discussion has come to the board level, I don't know, remember how many times we've had this discussion, but it's like, okay, where do we go? What do we do? It's like, uh, we don't know how to take the first step, I guess. Mm -hmm. I, and obviously we appoint a committee and they're struggling on their first step. That, this whole discussion, a lot of it should be them digging into the details and the weeds and then proposing something back to us. But, you know, I think they're struggling. But that's my point exactly, is that that's where, it's, that's where it can become hard for a single municipality to chart the way forward. Uh, for whatever reasons, you know, within within the committee. So that's where uh, it might be easier to consider to hand this discussion over to a district with a town representative at the table, where you know there is a more there are more people who are only discussing that. That's the only that's the only um, matter. And that's easier on the municipality because it I mean, just insulates you if that's desired from the back and forth with the committee um, and you know, participate in a different way. I mean, I really feel, um, and I don't know if Charles left because he's in the back room. He's okay. Coming into you. Left because he doesn't like what I'm saying. <sighs> All right. Um, I, 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 as I, very from where I sit, I feel that the option, that, that, um, there are options for Johnson. It's benefited me to be looking at things in a rather simplistic way rather than digging into the details of some, you know, very fine questions that don't have to be answered right at this point. Um, uh, and so, 
you know, those, those options, I, I could I could work with the committee a little bit more on, you know, working on the options that are a little more specific for Johnson, but I do see the possibility of Johnson joining or applying to join the North East Kingdom Communication Union District. There may be a different path if we get this feasibility study and business plan grant. Uh, to be uh, to be looking maybe maybe at a different formation that would not have to involve joining the Northeast Kingdom, and then if it's if it's an option to be pursuing individual providers, then the path there would be to talk to them and get to a point to understand exactly what the what the proposal is in detail, and they say, and then either say yes or no, and and, and provide and. But it's, it's very important to move you in because you are going to be the one to make the decision in the end as to what, what is the right way. So uh, that's why I, I, you're the first one who are talking to on this, but we are ready as far as the, the LCPC, we are ready to transition from the committee backdrop to select board um, prime time. And hopefully, you know, along with the committee members, um, and presenting on a strong front, front, just saying, you know, this really needs to move forward. Would be good. It seems like we need to be one really clear, obvious next step would be to start conversations with the NEK district, Union district, um, and see what the steps are for, for joining their their efforts. I know, you know, some on the broadband committee. It seems like there was a split, um, but we're really excited about it and had talked quite extensively to EC Fiber. Am I correct in, in talking about building out um, the the system um, and going it on our own that way? I think it was MC Fiber. Was MC Fiber. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I feel that we can make a, make a headway in terms of clarifying on those paths. I'm really hopeful that meeting that we're going to have here at the end of February, yeah. we are inviting uh, another consultant who has been working closely with, um, with um, the Northeast Kingdom on, on their study. Um, and I, I've been making familiar with the background of Lamoil, and we're really hoping to dig into a little bit more into these paths forward, um, so that communities can, you know, can can make a decision. Do you know what time that meeting is going to be at? It's six o'clock, I believe. Here, my sense is that the. Um, our, our committee, we didn't, you know, we appointed a committee because we don't have the time, don't have the knowledge, don't have the information to do this. And, but, you know, they're stuck with trying to decide. They're, they're not the decision maker, you know. I think what we need to tell them is we want this, we want something, figure out what's the best thing for us and come in and tell us what it is. Uh, it has to be moved. It can't be, it can't be, Stymied. You know, we have kids who can't do their homework, uh, and, and, and we need to work on this. Uh, so, you know, we won't part with the, the the right to decide. But boy, you know, we want we want it, and we want them to work on it, and don't leave us behind. You know, from where everybody else is going. I don't know which way it's going, which which is the best thing. That's what I wanted them to figure out. And come and tell us and move us forward with that. You know, it's a do it proposition. Well, I think they came to us with basically the same options. I mean, that, that we have sort of, um, that, that Lay has, has pointed out here. Negotiate with providers, join NEK, or form a new CUD. Uh, there was the other option, which was uh, waiting for. Um, the co-op to do something, but there's so many variables at play there that are unpredictable. We can't really depend on that. So it seems like we have two very just clear options, and they are saying we should pursue them both concurrently, right? I, I, didn't I have... think I think it's possible. I'm sorry. 
and I didn't know who you were addressing the question to. Okay, I didn't know if you wanted to. Yeah, my my sense is that they had a survey and they were caught. You know, they they gave us the information, but they I didn't have any sense of how do we let, let's kick this can down. You know, I, we're kicking the can down the road. We're not moving it forward. You know, I'd like to say, you know, we'll back you up. You figure it out and, and get it, and let's get it done. Sure. Linda? Is there, I have no idea if it's on the committee or anything about the committee, but is, so they could talk to NEK, they could talk to Consolidated, they could talk to Mansfield, and get a, whoever their person is that organizes those things, and get a feel of what they think would be best, whether they are even interested in Johnson. Wouldn't that be a starting point? You talk to those mm -hmm. groups and you find out whether Johnson's even anything they want to do with, and then go from there. Well, and, and, and I'm Charles is here from the committee. He's done, oh. he's his excellent knowledge on the subject. He's done a lot of digging into this. So I, I feel like a lot of it, um, you know, at least individually, uh, you have a good sense of what the potential, you know, landscape could look like for Brian and Johnson. So uh, I, I think a lot of educating you know, has happened. I mean, there is, as I said, when we started, Charles was already far ahead, getting maps and turning routes and, you know, look, you know looking at the possibilities, but... Uh, have you talked to any tech or any of those? Talk to Mansfield Communications. Uh, I'm not personally not interested in talking to Comcast because their technology is obsolete. Yeah, yeah. Comcast. They want to do it. Uh, coax. What about consulting? What did Mansfield say? Were they in, at all interested in Johnson? Yes, if we find it. Like the way Fletcher is, that kind of stuff. Um, I'm not sure about what Fletcher's doing. I'm a little bit familiar with both, so I could get off track, but I believe that we're in a situation that's a little bit different than Fletcher in that, like Leah described, they went in and financed themselves laying out kind of high density areas. And then we're getting public financing to kind of fill in the rest. Our problem is that we're 70% Already. Yeah, our high All density areas are already is the done. The low income areas, the low low revenue areas. So we're partially filled up with Comcast and Consolidated. We're seventy percent full of Comcast and Consolidated. So Consolidated could potentially be the one that would expand out further. Potentially, and we have not spoken. Yeah, that's a step. And if they're willing to do fiber. We'd be interested if they just want to extend DSL. Right, right. No, thank you. You know, I think it's important to talk to these providers. Mm -hmm. By the end of year 2020, um, there's going to be a lot of federal dollars uh, released towards rural broadband build-out. Johnson may not qualify in phase one because it's going to only be for areas, for census blocks, that don't have the 25 English street, which a lot of Johnson does. Okay, that's Comcast. There will be phase two uh, where potentially Johnson could qualify, but my point is that if these providers know that we are interested and we are working with them, then we can, because they are the ones, this is federal dollars, what to apply. There is another program where a provider has to be the one applying. So we do need to have a sense from them, consolidated in particular, do they have any interest in applying for areas like the northern part of Johnson and southern part of Johnson where, you know, they are struggling? Mm -hmm. uh, well, we, don't the, we don't have a we need that. We can't do it without. So, so that's my point is that if we talk to them, then we are higher on, on, on their radar possibly than, than if we don't. So I would recommend that being definitely an option for Johnson. I would not give up on consolidating. Any I don't know if any of you guys have consolidated, but uh, I've heard that they have really awful service for what's worth. 
I hear it ups and downs. I hear both. On DSL, but you're talking about in New Hampshire, they were fired. Yeah. Which would be completely different. Well, they're also going to probably charge a briefing for that, correct? I mean, well, the MC5 and the rates are actually through the roof. I checked it out when they went to your first meeting, and it's like $90 for basic broadband. So yes. That's pretty That's, that's, that's what pretty it is for That's what it is. That's what that's it is what for Comcast. Comcast. Yeah. Yeah. for 60 megabits. Mm -hmm. With Comcast. Yeah, Comcast. Today. Yeah. Yeah. So well, it's all $5 every six months. That's true. That's <laughs> 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 No, they're all bad. I'm just saying there's, uh, there's going to be some technology. I think that will be make a lot of this obsolete if we're just trying to get the less press than 30%. Well, it's going to come out. There's going to be a lot of satellite internet, internet options at the end of 2020. Uh, so if we're just talking about the web press of 30%, I mean, it might be worth waiting to see what kind of technology comes out at the end of the year because a lot of that might be obsolete. But either way, I would desire fiber. I mean, I think the satellite has its ups and downs, but it's going to cost a lot of money. T-Mobile says they've got 100% of the country covered with 5G right now. So we're covered with 5G right now. <laughs> I would definitely recommend, you know, if there is a provider that is willing to talk to us to, and to pursue those sort of conversations to a point where we understand in detail what the deal is, so that we can either say it's good for Johnson or we refuse it. And if that doesn't work, we move on to another option. And then in the meantime, there is a district option, uh, which we know wouldn't be bad for any community. Uh, it's just it's going to take time in, if there are, you know, there's just a lot of towns, but you see that. the way the way I see them. And then maybe <coughs> somewhere down the road, and this is what Vermont Electric Co op told us last week if you guys have a plan, show us your plan, and then we'll work with you to understand if, as part of your plan, we could benefit as a co op. And that's when we can start talking about co-investing into infrastructure together. Okay, so they want for Johnson to have a plan of where this infrastructure should go. Uh, and then if we have it, we bring it to the table and they say, oh, yeah, this particular row, you know, we could use something for our purposes as a co-op. And therefore, it's worth for us to co-invest in Okay. I was just curious, are there any statistics on the population uh, in that 30% area, number of households that aren't covered? Or yes, I have all those numbers. Because I'm just curious if it's if it's viable to extend if there's enough people that are even want the service in that, in that area. On average, I hear that what, what these providers need, but that's where the importance of the larger area comes. Uh, into play on average, they need six subscribers per mile on a fiber optic infrastructure to make it viable. So that's the, that number has been surprising. Everybody in the old Vermont, because there are companies out there who are willing to work with that model, and I've heard it from several providers that on average, six customer subscribers per mile, they can make it all of it. Do we look at anything like that? That yeah. I don't know. The other thing is they need a minimum number of people. Right. Six per mile for total eight hundred customers. We don't have that in Johnson. For people who aren't covered, but I think we've talked we've people talking about people who have consolidated or who have Comcast weren't satisfied with Comcast. The but people, that's really hard to predict. The people we've talked to are not interested in competing with Comcast. Yeah. Jackie? Because you can get it for sixty dollars today, but if some competitor would come in it would be forty dollars. Jackie? Uh, is our town only seventy percent served and thirty percent not served? Is that typical? Is that representative? of other towns who are in these districts and unions? I mean, like, um, are they 50-50? And how, how do we, what's the context on that? Um, 
Oftentimes, these districts are in areas where there is no Comcast, but there are towns that, that have a mix like Johnson. Uh, as far as rural County goes, Johnson, High Park, and Stowe are pretty much in the same boat in terms of percentages of, of you know, being served 25 over 3. Cambridge is 35% of uh, one of addresses that have this type of speed. Everybody else is just consolidated in itself. So, um, but uh, it, 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 one one scenario we're looking at is just to look at the towns through the feasibility studies, like Johnson, Hyde Park, and uh, Cambridge, uh, because they are in the unique both of like, being partially served, but then they, you know, so. But it goes back to those two scenarios that I about one at the beginning. Anyone else? Brian? I, I was going to say, Jackie, uh, to your question, I'm not sure about what the details were when EC Fiber started, uh, but a number of the towns that EC Fiber serves are places like Montpelier, Berlin, Barrie, uh, that I would expect that they were pretty well built out, um, but EC Fiber isn't running the exact same model that MC Fiber is, but MC Fiber is closer and more likely to work with us. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot of differences there, but. So Larry, you said that LCPC is going to kind of switch and start working with committees or working with towns? Well, I mean, we have been, you know, we have been doing it uh, when we receive like a specific question or a specific request. We have been working and we, and, and we, yeah, we have been doing it and we will keep doing it. We haven't been doing it at the select board level. But if we are going to move towards decision making, then we are going to be with the committees that exist be presented to the select boards on these various options. So there are going to be some towns that are going to have presentations at town meetings uh, about this. You know, nothing formal, but there is going to be a topic raised to discussion. Um, but, um, my approach is to the we'll meet the town where they want to meet us. Is basically, you know how I would like to do it. I don't want to push a regional approach for where it's not welcome or you know it doesn't make sense. Um, so, does any do towns ever submit requests for proposals? I understand you don't do that to them to NEK, but you might, you know, can you solicit generally say the town of Johnson is, here's where we are, we are interested in serving the last mile, and uh, can you tell us if you're interested in wiring the town, or however one would, would uh, and just, just to, to attract, the, to start the discussion with different providers, should, you know, that might be interested. Yes. Um... I, I haven't seen uh, that much being done in Vermont, but in New Hampshire, they are doing it all the time, and oftentimes, I, oftentimes, and all the time, it's, <laughs> I've seen at least three towns who have done that in, uh, in that have done that in New Hampshire, and I think they are somehow defaulting to cooperating with consolidated. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's kind of what's been happening there. Uh, I think it's definitely worthwhile. I mean, some providers might not respond to an RFP, but. I think it's a very legitimate approach. Uh, why not? Yes. Is there, a, is there a chance for the town of Johnson to sort of overstep the just catching up with everybody else and using something like totally some technology that's totally brand new and sort of being the first town in the field? Like um, Phillips just came out uh, like the. the uh, electric company is testing a new um, system where Wi-Fi is transported with light technology. They're calling it annoyingly Wi-Fi. Li yeah, uh, it's really fascinating. Um, and is there space that maybe Johnson could sort of be the, the the front runner in this kind of thing, especially 
you know, given that instead of playing catch up, we could be a, be a model for everybody else. Well, this is, it's a part of what's making it so hard because there is a feeling like there is a new thing coming up every other day and for people to keep up with all the technologies. So um, if it fell into our lap, I would say, why not? But otherwise, I would be looking at where success is, where it's solid and based on a, on a technology that is now considered state of the art. And that's fiber optic infrastructure, wired wired infrastructure, not wireless for for our hilly town of Johnson or, or state of Vermont. So no, but that but that makes it hard because there's 5G, there is this, there is that, and like who is going to keep up with that? So at some point you have to start banking your money on something specific, otherwise we'll just spin our wheels for a long time. And and fiber has has promised for many years to come, so I'd say it's a good one. Has the committee talked to any KCUD? To who? To any Northeast Kingdom no. consolidated? I, I, we have not talked to them. I've listened to them. Yeah, and they don't have a communication union to distribute it. It's, uh, you know, it's, uh, there are 20 towns, 26 maybe, that are voting on this very issue at the town meeting, and after which whoever whichever town joins or decides to form, then they will form it. We have been talking to, and that's also the meeting on the 27th, okay. to a consultant that tells them technologies that has been working with uh, and advising on the CUD. Okay. And that person is coming here. So I really have, I really have high hopes that they will bring us over the hump. Yeah, I've gotten conflicting information on how to form a CUD. I'm going to see if you can do it. Right. We could join one instead of forming one. Right? I've heard conflicting information on that. The Broadband Committee does not have a recommendation. Not at this time. Okay. So we're over three quarters of an hour into this. Yes. Um, I, I still don't see a path on forward of what we should be doing. Or, is any actual items for us? Should we be providing some direction to our committee or? Eric, appropriate $1.3 million and we'll wire the whole town. Option B. <laughs> <laughs> Wait. <laughs> well, I think you need to ascertain from your committee if, if they have more direction for you or not. And if it's not, then, then uh, you know. So, well. Okay. One of us needs to be at that 20, February 27th meeting. I would hope that members of the Broadband Committee would be as well. We're all looking at those. Meetings. Yeah, you have. Yeah. Your recommendation is to wait, you said, right? I want to hear what this 27th meeting, because like I said, I'm a CUD, I've heard this story, I've heard that story, okay. and the truth is somewhere in between. Right, so that's what we need to be. That's and I don't want to reinvent the wheel. There are two things that we need to be pursuing. That's one of them. And the other one is looking at providers directly, which you started doing. We started doing that. I think Comcast would be a good idea to talk to them. So if we could, if we could direct our broadband committee to to, go, to come up with a menu of providers that you should be talking to, and who's going to be the most uh, promising from that list? We would. Right. Stoke Cable is not interested. Well, that's not what we're doing now, but that, that's what we're directing. I would suggest we do tonight is direct the broadband committee to do that. Does that make sense to you, Charles? Say one more time. <laughs> to, ha to have the broadband <coughs> committee um, start talking to providers directly, come up with the list who's most likely to um, uh, to benefit us. Got it. Does that make yeah, sense? Propo proposals for Johnson and then. So wait a minute. Which he wants us to talk to him. Now you want us to get proposals? Well, you talk to them and find out what they're willing to do. I'm considering that a proposal. Okay. Um, and let's all go to the meeting on the 27th. Yeah. Those are the two action items. Yeah. 
and in our right. 27th, we'll hear more about the CDDs. And maybe the RIDs? The what? The whatever they're called, the new ones? Just to throw more in. Yeah, just make it muddier. Yeah. Right? That's what we're dealing with. I understand. You want to formalize a request for the community in a motion? No, oh, please. No, I don't. You, you guys understand what we're asking? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Working with LCPC as necessary. Yeah, so this LCPC, LCPC's Broadband Innovation Grant Feasibility Study application, are we in on that already? Do we need to do something to well, participate? You, you made the motion. We did it. We're supporting that effort. Right. Surprising when we did that. Amazing. Good. Thanks, Mike. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Nope. Thank you. Thank you. You yeah. moved us off our stump a little bit. Thank you. Uh, I guess. We're back into your agenda. Yep. All right. So I've got right here, we've got our, uh, the Town of Johnson Highway Access and Work in the Right-of-Way Policy. Uh, which you've got in your packet after Leo's uh, slideshow. It's just starting to get exciting, folks. Don't leave now. <laughs> Was this in an email packet? Sure. Yes. Thank you. So I want to just to. We got the feedback from uh, VLCT's legal review, uh, and I've gone over this with Brian Krause again. Uh, and he didn't have any comments about their changes, uh, but I want to first bring up the changes I made with Brian Krause, uh, which is on page eight. Uh, and these are not in your packet, so I want to mention them right away. On page eight, we replaced um, the can first par last sentence of the first paragraph we replaced construction slash development of the access to construction slash development of the project. Uh, next paragraph, second sentence, uh, third line says if after inspection is determined that the access has been constructed slash developed in compliance with the notice. Uh, we changed, again, access to project. And last sentence on page eight, uh, we changed access to project again. Okay, so that's the easy part. Now we'll start at the beginning. Uh, first comment from legal review. Going to page one. Uh, yeah, page one. First comment from legal review uh, says to avoid using gendered language. So they're concerned about uh, road foreman. Uh, so the solution we came up with was uh, replacing that with public works supervisor. Uh, that is currently our road foreman, uh, and I expect that our road foreman. I expect that to remain the same well into the future. The public works supervisor and road foreman are probably going to be the same person. Mm -hmm. uh, so I made that change throughout the document. Uh, and then the next comment is just alphabetizing definition. So I made that change as well. Page two. So we're looking at it without those changes? You're looking at it without those changes. Uh, the change, well, the document you have is has all the details on the recommended changes. Okay. Uh, most of which we are just accepting theirs, but there happened to be one where they mm -hmm. didn't give us a particular suggestion, uh, mm -hmm. so I had to come up with one. 
Uh, this, they've got a couple of grammatical changes, but then they strike the second paragraph and rewrite it as the, a new second paragraph. Uh, if you recall, uh, Nat, I believe it was your, you were the one who voiced concern about um, what somebody could do on their property uh, without requiring a permit. Mm -hmm. Like somebody working on their driveway or uh, anything like that. So we had tried to narrow the language down. They're recommending against that and they are encouraging broader language to uh, cover pretty much any work in the right of way should require a permit. Uh, kind of regardless of what that work is. Seems unrealistic. Why, why do they, they, they don't understand the practical limitations of that? Uh, their recommendation is uh, uh, more about asserting our rights that uh, if we the more restrictive we take it, the harder we might have to assert our rights in a particular case where we feel that we need to. Uh, if we haven't been uh, kind of throughout the whole process, been uh, very forthright about asserting our, our rights to our right of way, uh, that picking and choosing when we assert that is more complicated. So someone who has a paved driveway and Besides, so they're going to have it resurface. That first five feet that's within the highways right away, they're going to have to get permission. They would have to seek permission for that. Why? Well, I'm still not sold on that. Yep. I mean, I understand as the municipal, as the municipality, it, it's beneficial. I understand that for sure. But still, we have a lot of property owners who have rights that really need to be, I think, respected. And um, I think probably in those examples, like, like I just uh, asked, that would be pretty much carte blanche approved. It would be development that is going to affect maybe negatively our highway. You know, they're going to build a berm or something that's going to cause drainage back into our highway. Or, that, that's why we'd want to maintain that kind of... It would be easier to approve, uh, but it would still require an application and a recording of that application. Right. And so, uh, Rosemary, what's the fee to record something in the land record? $15 yeah. So it wouldn't be over a page, but we w it would require an application and a recording. So even if we waive our fee, uh, it would still be $15 to record it. To what extent can they tell us what we have to put in this? Um, I would recommend that anything we don't take their advice on, basically they have no authority to tell us what to do or not, but I would recommend that we go to our legal counsel for review on any changes that we make. So if we like the paragraph that we wrote that narrowly defines the scope, I think that we should go back with uh, probably to our personal attorney to get better advice on it. Again, because our personal attorney is the one who would have to defend this in court, uh, they're going to take a, a more detailed view on this. VLCT does a very good job of defining our rights and authorities broadly but they're not our legal counsel. Mm -hmm. um, Just say on Sorry. Well, how about on state highways? Like my driveway uh, is on the state highway. Do I technically have to get a permit if I want to resurface my driveway? Fair uh, question. That's not our right of way, so. Well, I know it's not, no, it's not <laughs> but, but I'm just, by comparison, well, I'm wondering. Oh, I don't know, but it wouldn't apply to this particular. I, I know. Yeah. All right. But but I, I, I guess I'm just thinking like if the state doesn't require a permit in that situation, maybe you guys shouldn't be more restricted than the state. I would be having to guess that you don't need a permit. You would guess that I don't. You do. You oh, do. That, that I do. Yeah. You do, but probably most people don't think they do. Yeah, I never would have even thought yeah. of it if I hadn't been at this meeting. There are a lot of driveways on the state highway system that are not approved and are not authorized to be there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
that's yeah. even in existence. But the state doesn't do anything about it. Not often. Um, the lawyers do. We have involved. The lawyers do when you have a title search and you don't have a highway access permit. And then you have to go to the state to get the permit. So at that point, your sale or your purchase or whatever is all in play. You know, it's the worst possible time to have it. So what's the thoughts of the board? Do they want to have our attorney review it? We want to go through the rest of the thing and come back to this one? Sure. I also think, I mean, it, it, as with the, the example of the state, if you need a permit to do things that, a lot of small things that nobody's really actually going to get the permit to do, defeats the whole purpose of the, you know, and then we're dealing with selective enforcement where a lot of people are getting away with it, but then some other people are getting away with it. So How long does the right of way policy have been enforced? Very, yeah. Yeah. Problematic. Our existing right of way right. policy? One forever. I know. I can't believe it's been so jacked up over all these years that we have to make all these changes. Every time we go through an ordinance, there's plenty of changes. I just can't believe it. It's just it's almost like rewriting the whole thing. Uh, we did. I know, but it's kind of ridiculous, isn't it? That we've been working under one for all these years and now we're going to do all of this. Uh, this one achieves a number of goals that uh, both Brian Krause and I think would benefit the town quite a bit. Okay. Uh, and thankfully, they didn't have any real problems with the, the parts that we really wanted to accomplish. All right, uh, next comment. Um, let's see. Uh, that just gets into cleaning up language. So I'm looking at comment five. Um, this gets into the a little bit of detail, but uh, our current policy uh, specifies that it's the road foreman or the road commissioner. Mm -hmm. uh, they're recommending that we limit it to the road foreman uh, as the person involved. Uh, or in this case, again, we've changed the road farm and language to uh, public works su supervisor. So why are they against the road commission? Uh, they feel that um, because the select board will retain the authority to step in if needed, uh, that we're better off than having just one designee for this, having two designees for this uh, could create a burdensome amount of paperwork for individuals if they're applying to one person and then they, you know, don't know, you know, should they apply to the road commissioner or the road foreman? I think it'll be a lot cleaner if we just have one designee that it's applied to the uh, road foreman or the, the public, public works, works supervisor. Work. Who's our road commissioner? I am. One of the reasons we named the administrator as the road commissioner is because they're here every day. And if the, the highway public works supervisor was not available, the road commissioner would be available. Yes. But if they're recommending against having two people. So we're going to eliminate the road commissioner. Well, this is just one thing, but yeah. uh, we don't have to have the road commissioner do it. The select board can always get involved, uh, or you know, even temporarily, a... you could even temporarily name a different designee. Because um, again, this is a policy, not an ordinance. You can say that, you know, we know the public works supervisor is going to be out of town for so long. Um, this can be a duty that we assign to whoever's acting as the public super work, public work supervisor, or you could designate it to the road commissioner for a temporary period. Well, the, the road commissioner certainly is going to have a lot more jobs to do in our area, whereas the road foreman is likely to be more familiar with the with the property. I, I, I don't I, I don't have a problem, you know saying that's the person that ought to be deciding this and as long as we have the ability to go elsewhere to the locals or later that's fine yeah that's our practice right now is 
road foreman handles all of these okay. applications. Yeah, well, right now it's the road foreman. Uh, right now it's the road foreman handles these applications. We want to move that. We want to, or this, the recommendation is to change it from the road foreman or the road commissioner to just the public work supervisor. I don't think for consistency, you wouldn't want it to be one or the either. That, that's their recommendation. Too. So we need to, in all of our printed um, paperwork, designate Brian Krause as the public works supervisor and not road foreman. But he can also be road foreman, or, but or designated as both. But yeah, um, because if we're referring to a public works supervisor in here, he's got to have a title of public yeah. works. No, supervisor. he can't be a road foreman. He has to be a road four person, or a road manager, or a road supervisor. That's suggested language that well, they. That's have, what the but, language is. Yeah, so I you can't call him a foreman anymore. Uh, page three, uh, they struck the uh, language on deposit because we already cover uh, security deposits in section seven. So it's redundant to cover it in two places and potentially confusing. Um, and again, modifying the language on re the recording of the permit that the uh, recording of the permit will be paid for by the applicant. We get into a little bit of detail about the uh, contents of the application. They change parcel to premises. And then we're on page four. Uh, they didn't like our Appendix D, which is a diagram we had for what good installation of a culvert looked like. Uh, they said that if we're going to do that, we should enforce that or it shouldn't be an appendix that we reference in the policy. We can still give people a picture of what good culvert installation looks like. Is that in your packet? Or? Yeah. Uh, they, I thought they cut appendix D. Yeah, there's no D to see. Yeah. Like I said, they didn't like our appendix D uh, with the diagram. Uh, I tend to agree with them on this that we can. If they don't like it, we're not actually, we didn't list it in here as a requirement. So I think it's fine for us to give it to people, but it doesn't need to be an appendix uh, part of the policy. But, you know, when people get their notice to proceed, we can hand them a picture of, you know, this is what good, you know, a little guide on like, this is how to install a culvert properly. Uh, you know, we've produced that, we, we know how to do it. We've produced material describing how to do it. We can get mileage out of it, but it's not really appropriate for uh, the policy. Well, are we, are we expecting them to, are we gonna go out and say, oh, that culvert's in wrong? Yes. Then they need a diagram. Uh, we'll provide them with a diagram. We'll provide them with some but you're just saying that it, it shouldn't be part of our packet, that it shouldn't be Appendix D. But we're just going to give them a diagram to tell them that's how we want it done. We want it installed properly and up to code. Okay. This is an example of what that looks like. Can't we call it Appendix D illustrative? Probably. Yeah, I mean, I, I, why, why remove it? around the bush. I mean, this, this is bureaucracy for bureaucracy's sake. Ain't that the truth, Doug? I mean, this is AOT all over again. Yeah. Is it? So can I ask, is this applying to just within the little right of ways? Yes. 
uh, it's just within our, our right of way. So it would apply on the part of your private property that's in our right of way. This does not address any place any of the ownership of property within the right of way, does it? No. Then it should, because of that difficulty that the village had with the trees that were uh, in the electric right of way. Those trees actually belonged to the to the homeowner, and it was their firewood. So yep. anything that is in a person's right of way, trees especially, belong to the owner of the property and nobody else. I agree with you. I don't think that we... That's addressed in state statute. We wouldn't... Repeat. I don't think we need to reaffirm that well, here. Well, I don't understand why not. You're reaffirming everything else under the sun here. Uh, why don't you just put it in there uh, under some section that, you know, property belongs to the homeowner? No, we're... What... Correct me if I'm mistaken, but... This is what we're requiring. What you're referring to is so designated by state statute. It's already there. It's above and beyond what we're, we're doing. The assumption of this is that it's work on a road in the right of way. Basically, yeah, that this is work that will affect our road uh, that's within the right of way, so it's within the part of a, a private property that we have control over. That's my point. My point is if somebody went through and uh, did work on the road and cut a tree down, uh, then the tree should be left there and it should be addressed in this. This wouldn't policy. be for our work in our, our right of way. This is for a private individual's work in our right of way. So this would be if you want to do work at your house, you would file an application like this. If we needed to do work on our roadside, on our right of way in front of your house, we wouldn't fill out a, a permit application for that. Okay. Um, but because we're working on your property, we wouldn't remove anything from your property without having some discussion about, you know, even dirt. Uh, Phil will have a discussion about do you need fill? Do you want the dirt um, before we take anything off of somebody's property? You know, trees, wood, anything of value, especially. All right. Uh, bottom of page four is just a language correction about uh, using consistent language. So page five, uh, section 10, they get a, into a little bit of detail here. They say that um, let's see, this is an issue of state preemption. The authority referenced herein is the authority that the legislature has explicitly delegated to the select board by statute. While the select board may in turn delegate that authority to other municipal officials, such as the road foreman, in order to execute those laws, it does not have the ability to abdicate that authority altogether, at least not by means of a policy. So, this gets into um, what we would do if, let's see. If development requires the elimination of an access that had been previously permitted. How would we handle it? Uh, and their comment on this is really just that that has to be retained by the select board uh, or you know that you can designate a representative but it's ultimately the select board so I'm guessing from reading the way this is written the highway foreman would maybe so direct it but he would need to bring it to the select board to get us sanctioned. 
it it may be kind of the cleanest way of, of handling this might be to eliminate the language that allows for the road foreman so that you're not preemptively designating the road foreman that power, but that the road foreman can come to the select board and ask for the authority to that do might be that. cleaner. Yeah, that might be cleaner to have it that. As often as this happens, it might be cleaner just require a select board. Yeah. I don't know that it's I don't know that we've we've ever had to deal with this before. I don't ever remember it. All right. Uh, the rest of page five is just a little bit of language clarifications, and they moved the section on appeals to the, the last section, We're having it come in the middle. All right, so this gets into a little bit more into the weeds. Uh, they, under permit suspension, and assurance of discontinuous, discontinuation, um, they say that uh, for these, they're not, these are more that they think that the town might not want to uh, designate the power to another person, that these are, um, you know, when we're issuing discontinuance or suspending somebody's permit uh, for violation, that that might be something that has to come before the board and the board can, on a case-by-case -case basis, issue to the public works supervisor to go ahead and, and revoke a permit and uh, require its elimination. So this would be essentially when someone has uh, applied for a permit, received a notice to proceed. You know, they applied for the permit. Uh, Brian Krause went out and followed up and said, this looks like a good project. I like what your design here is good. You get a notice to proceed. Then you don't do what you said you were gonna do on your application. You either cause a bunch of damage to the road while you're doing the work, or you do something that wasn't described at all. You do some other project. Uh, what do we do then? And that's where we can, uh, you know, the first step is giving them a notice that they, they're in violation and instructing them to take corrective action, failing that they take corrective action, then we're going to discontinue their permit and tell them to remove it. And the suggestion is that when it gets to that level of where we have to discontinue a permit, maybe it should rise to the select board's level. Potentially that could be court. The it could go to court. Yeah. Okay. So I think that's a good idea. I yep. would agree. Among other things, if it came to us, we, it practically would come to us because our public works foreman, public works supervisor, has uh, decided, made a decision that if it's at this level, it comes to us and we may say, we're going to send it to our attorney, whereas our, our public works supervisor really doesn't have that option. Yes. And speaking of that, the next paragraph, we rem removed the, there was language in here that implied that the public works supervisor or road foreman could have gone directly to our attorney. <laughs> which is not an authority that mm -hmm. we had intended to convey. So we eliminated that language. Right. Uh, section 14 appeals. Uh, this is largely just rephrasing the appeal section we had written before and just putting it at the end of the process uh, rather than in the middle. Um, you know, that this will 
hopefully uh, take a number of cases uh, where there's a conflict and help us keep it out of court by having a formal procedure uh, that the board provides and oversees. Then our forms. And uh, what the notice of notice of permission to proceed and the permit itself. So it sounds like most of the changes are uncontroversial with the exception of the uh, second page second and third paragraph. Now that you're suggesting we have that on to our attorney? Well, no, I mean, I don't doubt that our attorney will say the same thing. We're working in our interest as a municipality. That's just crazy. I wonder what our attorney thinks of the definition of non-municipal work performed in the town highway right away. Work is not defined. Highway is a highway system, which gets to Michael's question about all the, the entire right away. You know, so, um, and so, and I understood where the cutting of trees is. I'm, I'm looking at this now with, without a thorough knowledge of it, but I, I think there ought to, ought to be authority for a de minimis waiver, you know, and this, this is a, uh, every title search is a nightmare, um, and, you know, because, you know, we look for highway access permits now as attorneys, but, you know, we're never going to know if, if somebody replaced a culvert or, you know, and did it unofficially or not or, you know, properly, you know, or paved a driveway, you know. Uh, I, you know, I think that rather than retaining strict control, thinking about what Nat said, that we ought to uh, think about what's really going to come up and what are we going to know about and what do we want to know about. Some of this stuff is control, and it's just going to be a sham because we aren't going to know what happened anyway. It would be better to get conformity and have a record, a de minimis, you know, proposal to do such and such, you know, de minimis, not within, not work within, you know, not reading the substantial work or something. You know, I'd ask our lawyers, can we can we do something like that? Because we don't want to regulate and do permit. I mean, it's Permitting for permitting sake. I agree. I, I think that I get where they're coming from with this, but no, we're not. If we start charging money and time for every little thing, then people aren't going to do it. Right now, it's a free process, for, and we're having enough trouble getting people to turn in. in uh, proposals when they're doing work on fourth class roads. We don't want to make that even harder uh, to get compliance. I, everybody in town probably plows the f five to 10 feet of the town road. And we were thinking with fourth class roads, that would be work within our right of way. Is this work within our right of way? I drove some stakes to, so I wouldn't go off the road with my tractor and the culvert. Is that work within the right of way? I mean, obviously, you know, never occurred to me, you know, but there, I don't think that paving should be either. Yeah, I, I tend to agree that I preferred a, I preferred our, our change language that had a more restrictive view of what we were interested in. Um, As our attorney would be the one that has to defend us. Where, what's the board's thoughts on having Brian have that discussion? It feels like we pick everything to the attorney and it takes an extra two months, <laughs> six months. And how much money? 
Every time we turn around, we got to go to the turn again. This is just wild, actually. Well, do you want to uh, uh, not make the changes as suggested by the leaf? That sounds a good area. Okay. Wait, well, this was a boilerplate from the league that we started with. We I started with um, a boilerplate from the league uh, that did not address anything other than highway access. Uh, so we took their highway access policy and modified it to cover uh, all work within the right of way, and then started here. We started to narrow that down to what work in the right-of-way are we actually interested in? And they're pushing back and saying, if you're gonna be interested in work in the right-of-way, you should be interested in work in the right-of-way, whatever it is, uh, rather than what we decided, which was work in the right-of-way that was likely to affect the road. And that, is this all your fault? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> and this is a policy, not an ordinance. Yes. So a policy doesn't have the same level of teeth that an ordinance has. Right. But you were talking like a year or two ago about something out in front of your house, right? But you talking about something like that? Well, sure, but you know. I, yeah, we use that as an example, I think. Example. Yeah. If I put a bucket of gravel in my driveway, it's you got to get a permit at this point. Well, under this policy, which is... And if you put too much, you really should. Correct. Doug, do you think we'd better leave well enough alone but maybe just change some of the general neutral language and let it go with that? Um, you know, there could come a day that you rode that you didn't uh, have control over your roads. You know, <laughs> we do have control over our roads, but you, you're looking for more restrictive control. I would define what work in the right of way is because uh, that's what's not, you know, I would ask them to, the league, to tell us what work in the right of way is. Is it a well, that's physics right description? Or is it like, you know, like force or distance? What is it? Isn't it spelled out here? No person shall install, develop, construct, regrade, or resurface any driveway entrance. Positive material of any kind with, there within any way affect the grade of a highway, obstructed ditch culvert, drainage course that drains into a highway or fill. I mean, it's all there. Seems Which like a, paragraph is that? The uh, one they added. The one they added on page two. Seems like a pretty all-inclusive, workable definition of what you're talking about. Unless I misunderstood. That would cover the problem we had upon Gould Hill. I regrade my driveway three times a year. Yeah. And they ought to be happy for it. I, I would think you could say, you know, the develop the definition of work is installation, developing, constructing, regrading, you know, resurfacing a driveway. I would define that as work. Work shall mean. Mm -hmm. So the new part in the definitions of work mm -hmm. in the right of way is. Mm -hmm. And I don't know about regrading. Regrading so as to, to I, I get of rid of the get rid of the drainage ditches, you know. Yeah. And that the stricken paragraph got it. What we tried to do was that anything that affects. Uh, 
affect the grade of the highway or alters the flow of water into or out of the right of way uh, was what we were concerned with. I think we already used that one. What was their problem with it? Uh, that it's too narrow. That we're that applying that standard, we would miss things that we had. We do have the authority to regulate, but we can decide that we're okay with it. That we don't need to. Like Doug said, we might, you know, tick ourselves somewhere down the road that we gave up. You know, somebody's. Uh, we gave up the right to oversee something, but. But it is just a policy down the road. We could change it. Yep. I'd leave that one in. <clears throat> I thought we did a pretty good job when we the wrote original. that paragraph. Yeah, I'd leave uh, the original in. You know, that we... Okay, let's do it. The original? Mike, original? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, the changes you've identified, leaving this as original, in your mind, this is about ready to... Yes. To... I had a, a version with uh, their recommended changes and my changes made up. Uh, that was easy to make up. I didn't pick and choose which changes. So I guess the question for but... the board, are you prepared to approve as talked through or would you want to see a clean copy with all of the changes? We need a clean copy anyway, right? Yeah. So, that's good. so maybe if we can have a clean copy for our next meeting. And I, that won't be any problem at all. Um, okay. Like I said, I've, I've got a slightly different version ready tonight. So I'll make that fix to that paragraph that we want to keep and uh, we'll be good to go. You are not going to bother running by an attorney. From the sounds of it, no. Good. Light industrial park. Hey, I just, I just wanted to say yes. one thing, and I know that was a tedious process that you all just went through, but I wanted to um, acknowledge and, and commend you on the, on the gender neutral language. And I, I know it's hard, you know, to go from the foreman to the manager or the supervisor, um, but it's really important and it's really meaningful to me and to, and to a lot of people. And I heard, you know, some people kind of chatting and kind of trivializing it and I'm thinking it was silly, but I, I just want to say it's, it's really not silly. And, um, and, and so thanks for doing that. Thank you. Um, sorry, let me get my place back. Uh, Light Industrial Park, I've been working with Seth on the new Nexus statement and submission of the uh, grant. We're going to be... Uh, we're going to complete the submission for the next round of grants before town meeting. Uh, that we've set a, a, a deadline of the of February for that. So before town meeting, uh, we'll be in consideration again. Uh, again, this is going to be the faster process, mm -hmm. so we're going to be leaning on LCPC uh, quite a bit for. That was the million bucks. Yep, a little over a million dollars. Perfect. Uh, review old business. I do have I? one. I'm sorry. Yep. Um, I don't know if we have this in our town report or not, but it's been asked a couple times um, for a, a one-page summary uh, for a town meeting. Uh, total expenses so far on that project. Is that going to be available at the town meeting? or? I've got to do a little bit more accounting on my time for it. Uh, how much actual money we've spent is very easy uh, to produce. Yeah. Uh, we've got, uh, I, you know, a, a loan principal interest payment, principal mortgage. interest payment. What, what do you call it? The mortgage. It's like that. Okay. Uh, but I forget the term for it, but yeah, we, we have a very easy accounting of what actual cash we've spent on it. Yeah. Uh, my time is a little more nebulous, uh, yeah. so I've got to do a little bit more work on Look at my calendar, look at my emails, and total up some estimates on it because I haven't been individually tracking the time I've spent on this project. Sure. Okay. How much time should he look into that? I 
if he no, he if got thumbnails it for his time. <laughs> Spend hours on the project. Yes. No, 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 no. I Run really total. Yeah. The hard dollars I think are gonna be you know, probably what people want the most. Aren't there gonna be after originally the option payments and then and then the engineering payments, et cetera, on down? Yes, uh, uh, we've got some money that we spent on it before I came on, and I won't be able to uh, allocate for Duncan's time spent on it because those records just don't exist. Uh, but I do have some idea of what has been spent on it very promptly before we acquired it, what we spent on it since we acquired it, and uh, perhaps you could stick that in the packet. It goes out with the uh, merger study. Mm -hmm. oh. a yeah, let's do it as a handout. We don't want to confuse the two. We want that as a standalone, I would think. Okay. Um, Just oh. we get out there more, that's all. Did the town report get the summary pages in the budget? Perfect, thank you. Yep. Um, Then, uh, for reviewing the old business, um, you know, we will, the big thing I want to touch on there is the uh, racial bias training. Um, obviously, our, our February first, the date we had picked, um, the gym was not actually free that day. Uh, it was reserved for uh, the Mini Mac. Is the League, but it's not the town's basketball program. It's an outside organization's basketball program. So we can't, when they make the reservation, we can't kick them out or anything. But we do have a date in March that, pardon me, I want to get my calendar out. We do have a date in March that we're approved for. So this has been delayed a few times. Um, We're looking at March 7th. Okay, so it's first weekend after town meeting? Yes. That's what, noon to four, or is it 10 to two, or what do we have? Grabbing the hours. Uh, noon to five is what we have the gym reserved for. Okay. And that's uh, workable with the director there? I think everything's going to work out, but I've been wrong several times of having a wrench thrown in when one thing or another doesn't line up. Okay. So I want to share with where we're at as of today, but... Um, so this is a tentative date? Then. Yes, it is, it is a tentative date. When can we have a firm date on that? Because I think we're going to want to, you know... We're going to work on advertising and everything uh, for it. Um, I expect to have a, a firm date for that in the next couple of days. Okay, great. Uh, I just wasn't able to get it for tonight's meeting. Okay. Um, but the last people I need to talk to, I think, is just uh, Bo Yang at the uh, Human Rights Commission. Great. I think that's the only person I don't have confirmation for, but she knows. She knows that that's when we're looking at, but she doesn't know that we're confirmed for that is the date that's going to work. Sure. So. Cool. Thank you. I'm just hesitant to give it as a, a definite date because I've been wrong so many times about it. <laughs> Who is that training for? Uh, that's open to the public. Uh, it's a training on uh, conscious and unconscious biases uh, put on by the Ver Vermont Human Rights Commission. Oh, thank you. Any other old business? Uh, no, that's it. Okay. Um, Mike, you had something to bring up on sprinklers? Well, why don't we just look into seeing what it would cost? Get some prices on it and uh, 
I mean, it might be prohibitive. You're yeah. talking about sprinkling upstairs yeah. in this building. That way we wouldn't have to worry about if we had over 49 people up here and having to pick up and move someplace else. It'd be a whole lot handier if we didn't have to worry about that. And uh, granted, the trustees would have to you know, agree to it. agree to it and everything else, but you know, we could take the lead and get some prices uh, on it and just kind of go from there. Thoughts? Sure. Reasonable? I mean, are there advantages beyond? I mean, it seems like we don't really, it's not that big of an issue to bump a meeting into another space, but if, if we know, you know, know ahead of time, I mean, the, the village had a meeting a while back where they had to pick up stakes. And, doesn't mean that we won't have a meeting sometime that we might have. It's just uh, we want everybody to participate. And sometimes if you move from one place to another, you might lose a few people. That's a good point. So, yeah. Get a number. That'd be good. If yeah. it's a reasonable price, it might be something for us. To look into. Yeah. So I'm on, that it. should be easy to do, but that reminds me I'm on the phone uh, talking with the fire warden about our elevator right now. Um, okay. The window in the elevator service room, they want us to replace the trim with uh, non-combustible trim. We'll let you handle that. Yeah. <laughs> Just letting you know, we were, we're technically in violation right now, but we'll get that fixed. The elevator still works, all right? Yep. Okay. We've got a condition of room that for 90 days. Huh? We've been out of... No, we just got the permit for, oh, for oh. 90 days. Okay. okay. Good. Still, get all those items. Right. I'll smoke and talk to the Okay. Uh, we can. Um, uh, we're going to be entering into... One second. Just a second. Here. What's that? Oh, um... Mike had a question about some mail items. Mm -hmm. uh, the U.S. Census Bureau, we are going to have to take an active hand in this. We are likely to be one of the communities that's going to be difficult to count. Uh, really? Our population demographics uh, tends to be difficult to count. Uh, so it's it's gonna, we're gonna have to work with them a little bit about managing that. Uh, then we also received a letter from an individual uh, who is, has, has some uh, uh, complaints about the security lights surrounding the Dollar General Lake. You'd asked about uh, a year or two ago, sending a letter out about, you know, that we're, we don't like the lights, uh, we, in the past, we talked about their sign. big sign, sign light. Right. Not the you sent them a letter, light. but you never had a response. No, I never heard anything back from them. But we don't have any. We don't have any applicable uh, uh, zoning uh, yeah. for that. And they're, we're not subject to Act 250, so. Yeah, they're, they're not subject to Act 250 because they were under one acre. Um, and we don't have local zoning. That was kind of a shame. Does I heard they're trying the, it again somewhere else right now. The writer understand this that we really have limited, actually no authorization on jurisdiction here. I don't. It it's more out of frustration than anything else. I mean, we 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 don't have authority to to act in this case. Yeah. There's not really a lot we can do. We and there's nobody we even could refer them to because I don't think is. whatever contact I have uh, for Dollar General is a good contact because I never hear back from anything. I I mean, even a state because it wasn't Act 250. Yeah. Did you have the Nashville, Tennessee address? I'd have to go look at my address book to see what That's I had. Headquarters, I believe, it was in Nashville. I don't think it was in Nashville, but I we don't. Can't, we can't do anything anywhere with it. You know? Yeah. So 
Well, that's true, Doug. But you know, it's like I said before, if uh, if it's a company that's interested in trying to get along with the communities that they're set up in, uh, why wouldn't they want to throw a community a olive branch once in a while? I wouldn't start out with the assumption. Well, I know, but uh, you can always hope, you know. Hope springs eternal. No. I know the old saying, you put your hand in your rear end, it will grow there before that happens. Mm -hmm. but it's, uh, you never know. I just think uh, it's a huge national corporation we're a very small town in a very small state that probably they don't really put a lot of weight on, but. They offered us the opportunity to buy it. Yeah. You know, and we could affect maybe the lighting, but they probably expect for the lighting that you can't change, you know. <laughs> what was that, 1.1 million? I don't know. I, I wasn't enticed into bidding. <laughs> okay. Uh, if there's no other items, unless you folks have something, we're going to be probably entertaining a motion going to executive session. Um, we will not be taking any further items after that. What's that? I move we go into executive yeah. session to discuss the personal matter as allowed by 1 BSA. Uh, no, three, one made three, it eight, four. Uh, We have a motion to go into executive sorry. session. Do we have a second? Second. Second. A second. Any more discussion? All those in favor, signify saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, show us at 934.